Christ, who is our Lord, our Savior, and our friend. Amen. Now, I think I told you the apocryphal story of how Luther wrote the small catechism before. It's said that he did so in response to that oh-so-childish, but not in a bad sense, question that his son Hans would continually ask, what is that pup? He passed his faith along to his son Hans, responding again and again to that simple question. And in doing so, created a resource that is simple, compact, and packed full of the faith of the Lutheran Reformation. Now, any idiot, myself included, can write of systematic theology using technical words borrowed from Aristotelian philosophy or Platonic thought or Cartesian logic or any other number of philosophical schools. But to teach the faith in six small pages so that even a child can begin to grasp what you mean, that is real theology. Yes, this little document, Luther's small catechism, is filled full of the faith and can serve us our whole life long. In fact, Luther was so enthralled and so sure of his small catechism that he encouraged extended families to daily use it as a devotion, as a devotion. Additionally, he insisted that four times a year churches ought to gather together and review its contents for an entire day. Well, as we've been reviewing the last 60 years of St. Stephen, one of the things I noticed in our history is we've never done that. So we're going to try. In fact, the sad truth is that most Lutherans have not examined the small catechism since either their confirmation or the confirmation of their youngest child. It's a shame, because everything you need to know about the faith is right there. Yes, things quickly get more complex. Our initial answers become larger and larger questions. But it's there. It's a good foundational document to stand on to look out at the rest of the world. So, for the next six weeks, in my preaching, in our Bible studies, and in our private, private devotional practices. We'll be focusing on Luther's small catechism, starting today with Luther's explanation of the Ten Commandments. Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord God, may the preacher decrease, that you increase. Amen. Luther interprets the Ten Commandments in light of Jesus' framing of the greatest command. Love God, love me. Each command begins with an exploration of how the command stops us from committing idolatry, which of course stops us from loving God. Idolatry, the worship of a false God. Then, it goes on and expands on how the commandment helps us to love our neighbor by expanding the thou shalt not and adding to it thou shalt. You shall have no other God before me. It all stands or falls right here. All the shalls and the shall nots, all our actions are measured by the simple question, how are they a response to God's freely given gift of life for us? How ought the creature respond to the Creator? No other gods may, of course, seem like a far-off ancient thing that we really don't have to worry about so much these days. 
unless you take the time to reflect upon the things which you have made an idol. And unless you ask the question, what do I fear? What do I respect above all things? When the stuff hits the fan, when I'm pressed between a rock and a hard place, where do I turn? Your answers to these questions, if the answer is not God, those answers, they're your idols. So, always cling to the faith you have, that has been given to you. God has freed you to live life unafraid, trusting in Him who loves you deeply. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. There's a grave danger in simply speaking the name of God. Whenever a finite creature speaks of the infinite, there is the danger, a great danger, of idolatry, of naming something that is created as creator. We might cloak a lie in God's name, hide our own sin under a cloud of piety, Yes, a dangerous thing to speak this name of God, for it might be done wrongly and used in ways that dishonor God, attributing to God things that are not of God. To honor God's name, we ought to call upon God in all times of need and pray to God and praise God with our lips and in our lives. Remember the Sabbath and keep it whole. Sabbath is about rest, liberation, and holiness. Sabbath ought to be a time good. My little pause here gets longer and longer each time I say this phrase. For nothing. A time free from the rest of the week. A time marked off to rest. Sabbath is also a time of liberation. Part of living into God's holy time is spending time in acts of kindness and of justice. Sabbath, finally, is holy in and of itself. Sabbath drives us into the reality of God through worship together, where we can cherish the promises of God. Sabbath forces us to come face to face with those things that keep us from rest, from service, of neighbor and keep us from worship. These things we abandon Sabbath for, those are idols, exposed by God's holy time. Honor your father and your mother. I suppose it's a very practical command, right? After all, it's coming from Luther the father to Hans the son. It is also one that once again attacks those idols that we put our fear, love, and trust in. It is from our parents and all those who raise us that we learn what is dangerous and what is safe. It is from that we establish, or for some of us don't establish, a sense of love and of trust. We're little sponges as children. And those things we sop up at that time period, that formative time in our life, become our lifeblood for the rest of our lives. Our basic fears, loves, and ability to trust are established in childhood. So even as we pray that everyone honors authority figures, especially parents, we pray all the more that authority figures honor their awesome duties to all who are entrusted to them. You shall not kill. What would you kill for, right? What would you kill for? That, quite clearly, is an idol. Something for which you would be willing to maim the image of God. Instead of killing, we should spend our days giving life to our neighbor, 
This, for Luther, is a full-time job. Doing the opposite of killing, being life-giving, is a lifelong and life-filling task. You shall not commit adultery. There are many relationships we have in life, and our relationship to our spouse ought to be one of the deepest of these. Marriage is a place for forming trust or for having trust broken. If we cannot trust our spouse, you can ask, who can you trust then? Such a break can deform so many of our relationships, even our relationship with God. This is why we ought to honor those who struggle to love one another and trust one another with their whole lives. This is why we ought to support trust and trustworthiness in relationships. This is why we ought to build up our neighbors' marriages and relationships. You shall not steal. So Luther was a little scary and a little morbid at this point. He states that if every theft, every thief were hung, no human would be left on earth. Theft is not just knocking over a bank. It's gaining other people's goods through nefarious means. Tipping the scale when weighing a product, selling inferior goods or price gouging, not giving 100% at work, not paying enough for people to live on, buying things that cause the suffering of others. Before you know it, we're all truly at the gallows and faced with the fact that Theft is ultimately trusting, fearing, or loving things instead of loving people and loving God. We ought to protect the integrity of our neighbors and all they have. And we ought to work to better their livelihood. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Any claim we make against another person we should be willing to defend in the court of law with the danger of libel and perjury pointed against us. Talking bad about a person is like pushing toothpaste out of a tube. So easy to do, right? But, but putting it back in, shoving that toothpaste back in the tube, taking back those things you've said, almost impossible to undo. I pray that we train our tongue to talk well of our neighbor and defend them from all defamation, that we might interpret all they do in the best possible light. You shall not covet your neighbor's house or household. So, we might be able to squint at the Ten Commandments until they sort of blur together a little bit. And then we can pretend that we've never broken a single one. But these last two push the breaking of commandments into our very heart and into our very imagination. Have you coveted any of those things that you did not steal? Have you wished someone dead who you did not kill? Have you lusted after someone's spouse, but never acted on that impulse? Have you thought of dishonoring your parents, but kept quiet about it? Has the breach of the law crossed your mind or filled your heart with perverse hope? If so, there you go. You coveted, you covetous person, you. You will be sent home today with a copy of Luther's small catechism as well as a devotional related to Luther's explanation of the Ten Commandments written by a Lutheran pastor in Georgia. I pray that they will help you to discern in the particularities and peculiarities of your life 
those things which separate you from God and from neighbor, and help you to discover the ways to repair those breaches. Sisters and brothers, God has freed you to live life unafraid, trusting in Him who loves you, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and hallelujah.